Good evening. I'm Spot on Weather, meteorologist Matthew Euler. Welcome to tonight's video. And this video is titled, Timing is Everything. And if you're a winter weather lover, you live in the mid-Atlantic, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say timing is everything. Because in the winter time, there's never really a complete guarantee that you're gonna see any type of snow. You know, it's gotta be the perfect timing, the timing of the colder air from the Northwest, from the North Northwest, uh, with that moisture coming in, generally from a southwesterly direction, you get that overrunning effect of the moisture moving up and over the colder air at the Earth's surface. And that's when we get our snow events or even our mixed precipitation events in the Mid-Atlantic. So timing is definitely absolutely everything. So I figured that's an appropriate video. And uh, let's go ahead and break down tonight's content. Before I begin tonight, I wanted to cover some big questions. You know, I'm just on my way into work this morning and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, you know, after I took a quick look at the latest weather charts, I literally was just thinking to myself, you know, I have this just inquisitive mind where I'm always wondering, you know, why things happen the way they do or, you know, sometimes I just bounce between topics and meteorology. These were the main things that came to my mind this morning. This is what I really was thinking about for the upcoming two week pattern and then for that, for that, you know, for the rest of the winter in general, for that matter. First one is the weakening La Nina. All right, I'm gonna give you a La Nina update. When will that La Nina complete its transition to ENSO neutral conditions? Next, the Madden-Julian oscillation, the MJO, the forecast phases as well as the magnitude. Third, I was thinking about the stratospheric polar vortex forecast and its potential impacts. Right now, we're showing a tendency for the, the models are showing the tendency for the vortex to weaken. Additionally, looking at the teleconnections forecast and their potential impacts, where is that position of the Northeastern Pacific Ridge axis? That's gonna be crucial as to where that downstream trough sets up. Additionally, the location of that baroclinic zone. I've talked about the baroclinic zone before, and just to basically break it down to basic terms or definition, the baroclinic zone is that boundary separating the milder, very mild air from the very cold air. And the overhead jet stream and the upper air disturbances, they tend to you know, basically form right in the vicinity of the baroclinic zone because that's where your strongest thermal contrast is occurring along the baroclinic zone. Again, you're separating some significantly different air masses, warm on the one side of the baroclinic zone to cold side on the, uh, the cold air on the other side of the baroclinic zone. And a lot of times what happens is wherever that baroclinic zone sets up, the orientation of it as well, that's really where you're gonna have those surface low pressure systems, those storm systems, really, really, that's gonna be their track that's where they're gonna go. They're gonna go right along that baroclinic zone or that zone of greatest temperature contrast. They get their energy off that very large temperature difference over the short horizontal distance. Additionally, I was thinking about the timing of the systems. That kind of gets back to the title slide tonight and saying that timing is everything. It really does matter, the timing of the systems. You know, a lot of times in the mid-Atlantic, what we typically see and we typically see more of this, where we get moisture and milder temps or moisture and warmth. So we get that rainfall in the wintertime with the milder temperatures, and then you get the cold front to come through, and then you just go dry and cold behind the cold front on northwesterly winds. This happens a lot in the winter. Specifically, I can speak for this myself here in the Hampton Roads, Virginia cities. A lot of times you get that rain in the warmer temperatures and the dry and colder air behind the cold front, behind the storm. Um, and you know, that dry is the big term there. You just don't get many situations across, let's say Southeastern Virginia for sure, from my experience, uh, where you can go from a rain over to a heavy snow, post frontal. Just doesn't happen much here. Additionally, the other case would be the moisture overrunning the colder air, you know? Will the cold air be in place? Will we have an example of that would be the cold air damming effect down the eastern seaboard. And then you get that overrunning moisture coming in, 
from the southwest as an area of low pressure develops in the Gulf of Mexico, all right, and then kind of rides up and off off the uh, shore, off the coast. That's happened before too, and we get some of our, our more of our more prolific. Uh, winter storm producers, big snowstorms. When you have the situation where you get this cold Arctic air, it's very dense, it's very shallow, locked into place with a high pressure system to the north, and you get this moisture that overruns that colder air at the surface, and you can get some pretty good snowfall amounts. These are the big questions. This is what we're facing. What I'm really feeling is going to be all this, you know, the combination of all of this. You know, how does the timing work with all these moving pieces or parts? That's really going to determine the remainder of our winter weather. Let's start with La Nina. I'm going to show you a couple different charts tonight compared to my last video that I made on Friday. Starting over here on the left, uh, we're looking at the latest weekly sea surface temperature departures, how above or below normal the water temperatures are in this Nino 3.4 region right here. And right now, the Nino 3.4 region is seeing about a minus 0.7, so 7 tenths of a degree Celsius below normal water temperatures in that Nino 3.4 region right now. Okay, by the way, these graphics are courtesy of NOAA, Climate Prediction Center specifically. The middle graphic here is showing um, the temperature changes in the weekly sea surface temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius. Now this goes out all the way up to as recent as 11 January 2023, but you can kind of see it, it goes from 14 December to 11 January. And look at the orange coloring showing up here. Now, what does that orange coloring mean? We look at this scale here at the bottom, this temperature scale. It's, it's indicating a warming. The brighter the orange, the greater the warming that's occurring in this east equatorial uh, area, east equatorial Pacific area, uh, off the west coast of South America. So we're having warming. See the orange coloring? And look at the scale here. This is on the positive side, warming. Okay. Um, so that's another factor. When we look at La Nina, what's going on in that Nino 3.4 region? Well, in the eastern equatorial Pacific, we're seeing some more um, drastic warming that's taking place. If we look at the official NOAA Climate Prediction Center ENSO probabilities forecast, which was issued, in fact, this month in January 2023, the tall blue bars indicating the percent chance or probability of La Nina is the tall vertical blue bars the gray bars are neutral condi conditions, and so neutral conditions. And then this red vertical bar represents El Nino, okay? Now El Nino now is the opposite effect of La Nina, where we get warming waters in the eastern uh, equatorial Pacific with El Nino, okay? So what are you looking at here over time is we're looking at a drop-off or a decrease in the height of these vertical bars with time, the three, month, uh, three months here are clustered together down here at the bottom. Uh, so, for example, this blue bar represents for January and February and March a La Nina, a 60% chance of La Nina conditions, about a 40% chance of ENSO neutral conditions. But by the time we drop into February, March, and April, look how much taller this gray bar got. All right, so now we're looking at over a 70% chance of ENSO neutral conditions some, at some point between February, March, and April with La Nina chances now less than 30%. And then that just continues. And so neutral conditions, very dominant, over 80% chance by the time we get to March, April, May, and then April, May, June, still, and so neutral conditions is the tallest bar, that gray bar there, the greatest probability, over 70% chance of occurring. And then as we get towards late summer and the fall of this year, we're starting to see you know greater than 50% chance of El Nino conditions, all right? So bottom line here, La Nina, and I know I keep saying this every video, but La Nina continues to weaken and we're getting warming that's occurring across the equatorial Pacific Ocean right here, okay? And this, by the way, at this classification for the temperature departure, minus 0.7 of degrees Celsius in Nino 3.4 region corresponds with a weak La Nina now. Now, let's take a look at that Madden Julian oscillation forecast. This can be a very important factor and determining the uh, general weather across the United States, how the upper air pattern sets up, what kind of jet stream configurations we see. And you know, you're talking, you know, you look at the MJO, Mad Julian Oscillation, the various phases of it, and you say to yourself, why do I care about thunderstorms in the Indian Ocean? Why do I care about enhanced rainfall in the Indian Ocean? Why? Uh, why would I even care about that? What about over in, you know, let's say the maritime continent in Australia? 
Why do I care that Australia is getting flooded? All right. Well, it all ties in. The thing is, is, you know, the whole entire atmosphere, there's feedback mechanisms and processes in place. And whenever you get rising air motion, enhanced rainfall, um, convection in certain areas of the tropical Pacific and Indian Ocean, it can lead to downstream effects. Here is the latest forecast for the MJO, Man Julian Oscillation Forecast. This is the Jeff's V12 for today, running out to the end of January, 31 January. This is where we are today. We're in this small inner circle here. And I can remember just about a week ago, week and a half ago, how this forecast was out here in phases eight and one. Look where it is. It's in the null phase right now, in this small inner circle here, the diagram, okay? So things change over time with these MGO forecasts. They're constantly changing. So by the 17th, the Jeff's V12 is forecasting the MGO to be in weekly, the week come out into a weaker phase one, and then working its way into a higher magnitude, stronger influence potentially, uh, 17, 19, 21, 23 January in phase two now, and then rotating into phase three and still fairly significant magnitude here, okay? All the way out to the end of January. So Jeff's V12 says stronger MJO influences. That's what it's showing uh, as we go generally into phases two and three where we have convection, enhanced rainfall in the Indian Ocean and phases two and three of the MJO. What about ECMWF? What about the European model? Showing it also in the null phase to start, working its way outward into weaker phase one, here 17th, 18th of January this week, then coming into, rotating into phase two, phase three for the remainder of January. Actually, ECMWF, the European model, has MGO rotating back into the null phase by the end of January. What about the European extended forecast out through 16th February? showing a null phase, the MJO today, working its way out week phase one. Uh, not very strong phase two or phase three before going to the null phase. So the big, the big differences here between the Jeff's V12, GFS Ensemble, and then the European and the European Extended, is you can see the Jeff's V12 is much more robust with the MJO signal, uh, much more enhanced, um, stronger magnitude on the Jeff's V12 in the phases two and three as compared to the European and the European Extended. Looking at the temperature composites for going into phases two and three, the convection in the Indian Ocean, phase two, cooler than normal, nothing like eye popping. I'm not talking frigid. If we just look at the MJO alone for the months of January, February, March, yeah, phase two is cooler than normal in the east, but it's not super, super cold. The coldest temperature anomalies are out in the western U.S. with the phase two. Phase three, showing uh, a little bit colder, a little bit colder temperatures there across the eastern U.S., mid-Atlantic, Ohio Valley in phase three. Uh, but in general, the United States as a whole is, is generally cooler than normal with you have MJO in phases two and three. Now, what about our latest update on the stratospheric polar vortex. Now, this continues to be a very, very intriguing situation, okay? Um, this is the GFS forecast. I have the dates under each of these graphics to show what the forecast date is. So starting here on the left with the GFS, showing almost like a dumbbell shape here. See this? This pattern, it's elongated. See the green coloring? And you notice the purple coloring is the coldest um, Temperature anomalies, the coldest temperatures in the stratosphere are purple colorings. The browns and the or bright oranges are warmer temperatures. The lighter whites, warmer temperatures in the stratosphere, okay? Um, so in general, on the 20th of January, this Friday, we're looking at more of a dumbbell shape pattern here. So it's the elongation of the, of the vortex still. Now you will notice it's orientated pretty much from what appears to be like the Siberia, northern Russian coast, right on, right on across um, to the North Atlantic side, over Greenland, down to the North Atlantic side. So that's where that elongation of the polar vortex is occurring. By 25 January, look what happens. This is next week. See the purple coloring? It's dipping down now. The orientation or elongation of the orientation is extending from northeast to southwest now. It's rotated to this position by 25 January. And you'll this generally um, equates to colder than normal temperatures across the eastern U.S. And then look at the warming over the, the higher latitudes here in the stratosphere. This is impressive stuff here. Now look at 30 January here on the right, the forecast for the stratospheric polar vortex 
Again, showing an elongation shape. Almost looks like a little kidney bean, doesn't it? Uh, here in the purple and the green coloring here. This is your vortex. These are your coldest temperatures. Um, the core of that vortex is located generally to the north of um, Nova Scotia. And that would be just, I'm looking at my bearings here, uh, just south of Greenland is where the coldest temperatures would be associated in the stratosphere there. And then look at this warming continuing here in the GFS. GFS is the most robust model of all of them showing a dramatic stratospheric warming event taking place by the end of January. Let's take a look at the GFS, GFS Ensemble Stratospheric Polar Vortex Forecast. Very similar dumbbell shape. See this? For the 20th of January. Not much difference from the GFS, right? See that? So matching up very well, showing the elongation of the polar vortex out over the North Atlantic, just south of Greenland, uh, and also on the Siberian side, um, uh, let's see, that's going closer to Russia over there. And then 25 January is the, this is the forecast in the Jeffs for the vortex. See the orientation again, how it changes from north, northwest, or that'd be north, northeast to south, southwest. See this, right, this dip. The coldest stratospheric temperatures, elongation into the eastern U.S. by 25 January. See how that matches up well with the GFS? And then what about over here in the far right? Jeff's stratospheric polar vortex forecast showing the colder temperatures, the coldest temperatures in the stratosphere out over the North Atlantic, southeast of Greenland by the time we get to 30 January. And that warming is continuing, all right? So we have two models now, GFS and Jeff showing this warming event now. GFS is the most extreme. Look at the coloring here, this peach or salmon look. Now that is a major, major warming event in the stratosphere if the GFS were to verify. But in general, you know, we have high confidence in these first two frames for 20 and 25 January, how this elongation, the shape of the vortex is going to look like. And then finally, the European stratospheric polar vortex forecast. Look at that. It's that dumbbell shape again for the 20th of January. See how the European on the left here, the shape of this, the green coloring, how it matches up well with the Jeffs on the 20th, as well as the GFS on the 20th. See that? All are indicating a very similar orientation of the shape of the polar vortex. Okay. 25 January forecast here on the right, showing again, see? Europeans even showing that extension or elongation down the eastern seaboard by the 25th of January. I'm going to be very interested to see. Um, if there's any kind of response from the stratosphere down to the troposphere um, and whether we'll see colder temperatures as a result of this. The warming is showing up also in the stratosphere over the higher latitudes of the stratosphere, also on the European model. So we got really good agreement all the way through 25 January. We have warming on the Jeffs 25 January over the high north over the Arctic in the stratosphere. We've got it on the GFS and we have it on the European. These are past cold episodes. I want to throw this in tonight's video. This is why when I look at the shape or orientation of the vortex, okay, when I see it getting stretched out like a rubber band or elongated like this, all right, or like this, I like to compare past tropospheric temperatures, the troposphere where we live, kind of like what was the shape of the polar vortex in the stratosphere? How did those colder temperatures, how, how that elongation look? So this was the end of November, this was a few months ago, showing the purple coloring. See how the stretch look occurred again? These solid black lines are the height contours, and they're stretched out like a rubber band. And the coldest stratospheric temperatures are over Hudson Bay, Canada. This resulted in a very cold period uh, for, it was just a couple days, two to three days, but it was a very frigid air mass for late November for many locations in the eastern U.S. It went all the way down the Gulf Coast. And the middle graphic here showing what it looked like around Christmas when we had a very, that was a super frigid air mass that worked its way down into the eastern U.S. for Christmas period. And look at where that vortex is again, almost in the same spot as what it was on 20 November, generally around Hudson Bay, Canada, eastern Canada. See that purple coloring? Very similar, right? See that? Now, what about 14 January? We just saw this a couple days ago. Look at this. See this, the shape, how the polar vortex is elongated down the eastern seaboard? And what happens? What, what's our forecast looking like here? Oh, there's 25 January. There's 25 January. Now look at the Jeff's forecast for 25 January coming up for the stretching of the stratospheric polar vortex. And look at the 14 January, what happened. I mean, we were struggling in southeast Virginia this past Saturday, the 14th of January. We were struggling to 
We didn't even get to 40 degrees for a high. It was in the upper 30s all day with that strong northerly wind um, in this case. And of course, we had that big major storm, that very unusual storm offshore, um, taking on warm core characteristics. But I like to look at this. I mean, you see what the shape looked like for past cold waves in the east of the stratospheric polar vortex. And I like to compare it to the forecast. Very similar shape here on the GFS and the GEFs for 25 January, and even the European model on 25 January. And look what happened. It got cold here. So again, very interesting. Just I save these graphics and then I compare the what the temperature anomalies were at the surface um, just to see if there's any kind of pattern recognition I could take out of this as far as the shape of the vortex. Now, the stratospheric polar vortex is a very, very, um, it's not an easy thing to examine um, because you know, you may not necessarily get the effects brought down from the stratosphere back to the troposphere. Um, you know, you have cases where, and I mentioned this in my last video, where you have absorbing um, sudden stratospheric warming events, for example, which a stratosphere absorbs that wave activity flux or the energy being sent vertically upward or propagated from the troposphere. And sometimes that, ref that energy doesn't reflect back down to the troposphere where we live. But it's still very interesting nonetheless. Now let's take a look at the teleconnections forecast, the latest. These always are a huge factor this time of year. We always have to examine these and take these into account. All right, so starting, this is all European Ensemble Prediction System, EPS. So looking at the upper left here, we're showing the Arctic Oscillation, 50 perturbed member forecast, with the green line being the average of all the 50 ensemble members, okay? By the way, these blue bars, I never explained this before, but the blue bars indicate the wide range of possibilities over time, um, you know, um, of course, the further out you get in time, the um, more widespread the outcome, potential outcomes are going to be, the more uncertain we're going to get, and the lower confidence we're going to have in exactly where um, the, for example, this, this chart in the upper left, the Arctic Oscillation is going to be in, let's say, um, this point, two weeks out. So in general, the green line represents the average or the mean of all the 50 model members of the ensemble system here. So initially over here on the left, we're starting off a negative AO. It's going to climb its way up by the 21st, 22nd of January, 23rd of January, even 24th January is gonna be getting closer to neutral. And that's gonna drop negative briefly there, um, 26, 27, 28 January. The NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation Forecast here on the, on the upper right, showing, now this is a little bit different than a couple days ago. All right, I gave that last, I did that last video on Friday, and uh, I don't recall it dipping negative like this. This was uh, Friday, the NAO forecast uh, had it closer up here to neutral conditions, and maybe even slightly positive, if I recall right. Uh, but anyway, the NAO forecast, the latest show is a briefly negative 18, 19 January, working its way neutral through 25 January. And then look at this drop off to negative uh, 25 all the way to about 29, 30 January. So it's gonna be briefly negative now, the NAO, which, what does that tell us? That tells us we have some higher than normal heights in the upper levels of the atmosphere over the North Atlantic or somewhere in the vicinity of Greenland. Bottom left shows the latest EPS forecast, 50 perturbed members. This is for the EPO, Eastern Pacific Oscillation. Now this is a major change as well from Friday's video. This thing takes a little bit of a deeper dip to the negative territory, more strongly negative by 25 and 26 January. And then it remains negative all the way out to the 1st of February. That's the EPO. So there's some changes to the EPO becoming more strongly negative. All right. And then finally, bottom right shows the European EPS 50 to remember forecast. This is for the PNA, Pacific North American pattern. Generally slightly negative through 20 January, then working, um, looks like closer, yeah, right around neutral territory, right through the 24th of January. But then it dips fairly significantly negative, strongly negative, especially after 28 January to 1 February. And I've been seeing a lot of posts on social media talking about, hey, this is La Nina. All right, we're going to get to a La Nina pattern in February. That's what happens during February's in La Nina winters. It goes to where we get a southeastern ridge and it, all those higher heights go up the East Coast, and then the 
PNA drops a negative in these situations. And, you know, it, right now, I mean, it's, it's a really good assessment right now that you're seeing out there in social media because it does drop off negative. So if we just examine all four of these and what they would mean for the eastern U.S., if I had a fairly neutral AO, I would expect near normal temperatures. Uh, I wouldn't expect, um, you know, anything drastically above or below, kind of closer to normal with this kind of AO forecast. With the NAO, that dip negative now, that would put higher heights up in the North Atlantic over towards Greenland. And that would favor, you know, slightly below normal temperatures. This isn't a very long lasting um, negative NAO event like we had in December. And the bottom left shows, you know, this is interesting here, the EPO, it's dropping off more negative. This would be colder temperatures in the eastern U.S., Midwest to the east coast. And then over here, the negative PNA, that would not be a good thing for the east coast because um, that would put the trough, upper air trough, over the western U.S. and that would pop a ridge off the east coast. Okay. Now let's take a look and examine some of the latest charts. I'm going to be just doing comparisons of the ensemble um, the ensemble forecast at 500 millibars, you know, where the troughs and ridges are located. The orange coloring indicating ridges. Ridges, associ ridges are associated with uh, dry weather and mild temps. Green colors, blue colors are associated with troughs, below normal or colder temperatures, and unsettled weather, usually some sort of storm system or precipitation. And um, so in general, what we got going on by this Thursday, the 19th of January, we're seeing higher than normal heights, still in the vicinity of over Hudson Bay in eastern Canada. We do see another area of higher heights now south of Greenland. Uh, we do see a little bit of upper level ridging occurring off the west coast of the United States with a deeper trough downstream. Look at the green coloring here. This is a below normal height situation, lower than normal heights and troughing across the western U.S. and in Nevada and the parts of you know, Oregon, southwest Idaho. Um, and then you got another little trough over the Midwest. Now let's compare over here on the right. I'm showing the EPS. Every slide I show you of the ensemble comparisons, the left is going to be the Jeff's GFS ensemble. The right will be the European ensemble EPS. So very similar. You know, we have a little bit of ridging, by the way, in both of these ensembles, working with the ridge axis, extending a little bit up the East Coast there, up to New England by this Thursday. And it's going to result in some very mild temperatures across the eastern U.S. again uh, for this upcoming Thursday. You know, we can see highs in the lower 70s, for example, down in eastern North Carolina and Virginia. Let's take a look at Saturday, the 21st of January, this upcoming weekend. We're seeing this ridging now really getting strong. We're starting to see more of the high latitude blocking, which has been lacking uh, pretty much for the last few weeks. You know, we didn't have this upper level ridging, this high latitude blocking pattern, as that Pacific jet was pretty much moving pretty much west to east into California causing all those storms. But now this, this really shuts off that Pacific jet a little bit, okay? And we do have a trough that has moved now further east over parts of New Mexico by Saturday. And then we see, you know, more of a flatter zonal west to east upper air pattern or wind flow over the mid-Atlantic by Saturday. Uh, we still see a little bit of higher heights there in eastern Canada, generally to the east of Hudson Bay. But you notice how these heights aren't nearly as strong? Look at that, much higher, stronger above normal heights. Now look at this. So, all right, so in general, what we're looking at, I got a, I like my, my little partner when he walks in the room when I'm doing these videos, uh, my dog just walked in. But anyway, we still see the comparisons here on the right with the EPS showing that ridge as well over the Northeast Pacific, and we see the troughing over Texas Panhandle, and we still see that more zonal west east flow as well. For Saturday. So very good agreement between the ensembles. Now let's take a look at Monday the 23rd of January. Uh, we still see those higher than normal heights with the ridge axis orientated more southwest and northeast in western Canada. And then we have this downstream trough beneath those upper level heights, those higher heights and the ridging. So we have still that trough positioned over the Four Corners region, the desert southwest, by next Monday the 23rd of Jan January. And then we still see a little bit of higher heights there across eastern Canada. But again, they're not as drastic as they once were. Like this Thursday, this is like really, really high above normal heights. And now look at the lighter orange coloring by Monday, the 23rd of January. All right, so looking at the subtropical ridge, the southeast ridge, you know, that's, that's our public enemy, okay? That's public enemy number one if you want winter weather. In the eastern U.S. is that dang southeast ridge. All right, 
right now it looks like it's going to be positioned off the coast. The ridge axis is higher heights are pretty much off the east coast. Now you look at the graphic here on the right that shows the uh, European ensemble forecast for the 23rd, very similar placement of the trough, um, generally positioned over you know the four corners area, a little bit further east on the European ensemble. You also see an upper level high height center there off California coast, which is finally finally to give them a break from all those all that flooding they experienced for that um, two to three week period. And we still see you know a little bit of weak ridging across the Mid Atlantic, the zonal flow here. And then moving ahead to Wednesday, the 25th of January, 2023, things are starting to change now. We're starting to see an upper level trough, which is now moving east. Uh, we have upper level ridge. The subtropical ridge is still the main axis of the ridge is off the east coast. It's not moving back towards the east coast. It's off the east coast primarily. And then this strong upper level ridge over, you know, into the northeast Pacific by this point. Um, that's very interesting. And then you have another very strong high height center now which is basically extending northward towards Greenland, towards the eastern portion of Greenland. So we have two very strong high height centers or ridges, one over the Northeast Pacific extending north to Alaska, and the other one is up over the North Atlantic, extending towards the west, towards Greenland. And beneath that, we have lower than normal heights now across much of the United States. You notice where the coldest temperatures now associated with these lower heights would be from the Rockies, generally to the Ohio Valley. If you look at the EPS over here on the right, it has that colder air a little bit further east. Looking ahead now at the forecast for next Friday, the 27th of January, look at this pattern now. So now we have, um, we have troughing, we have upper level low, which has now moved over eastern Canada and the vicinity of Hudson Bay. Um, you know, we've been just having very mild temperatures in the east because we've had just abnormally high heights here. And now it's being replaced by these blue and green colors indicating below normal heights and colder temperatures and troughing now into the eastern U.S. This is the Jeff's forecast for Friday the 27th. Uh, we still have that higher height pattern over the northeast Pacific as well as ridging still continuing over the North Atlantic. And then look at the graphic here on the right. That is your European EPS showing the similar pattern. Now, in addition to these ensemble members, we need to take a look at the active weather pattern that's coming up. This is for the 23rd of January. Now, I'm comparing the European operational on the left to the GFS operational run on the right. These are both midday 12Z model runs from today, the 17th of January. This forecast is for the 23rd of January. So that'll be coming up this next weekend, the Sunday time period, late Sunday, the 22nd into Monday morning the 23rd. So we look at the European forecast and look at all of this precipitation. There's an area of low pressure basically over eastern Virginia um, and we have you know a nice little thickness ridge here. Uh, so we have those milder temperatures trying to work their way up the Virginia coast up towards Delaware. Behind this low pressure though into Pennsylvania, into West Virginia, eastern Ohio, southern New York State, we've got snow. It's cold enough for snow back here on the backside of this area of low pressure. That's the European model track. So we have a storm system kind of coming through the mid-Atlantic by the early morning on the 23rd of January. Now the GFS, what's it showing? Look at the difference here. Uh, this shows the low pressure system way up over Lake Huron area uh, and mostly a rain event all the way up, even in the parts of Pennsylvania, in the Ohio, and up into New York State. So here's the question. And again, it goes down to where is the Baraclinic zone set up? Where is this zone going to set up? Okay. Is it going to be generally where the European model is indicating it? Or is it going to be back further to the west where the GFS model is basically showing the Baraclinic zone? How much cold air is this system going to have to work with? And how deep does this trough dig? Because the deeper that trough digs, you know, you increase your amplitude, you decrease your wavelengths you're going to get the higher heights to pop up even greater ahead of that trough if it digs here. Then we move to 25 January for our next storm system. And this is real interesting. European, uh, the last couple runs has been showing this system remaining offshore, off the coast, not like this. GFS has that low pressure, 1,000 millibars over southern Indiana by the 25th of January. 
late on the 25th of January, whereas a European has it much more intense in offshore over the Western Atlantic. All right. So, you know, this is where it gets back to my main theme of tonight's video, timing. When does this cold air, you know, how far does it get southeast? It's a major battle that's going to be going on over this forecast period between this subtropical ridge off the southeast coast and this deepening trough to the northwest. That colder air is trying to push to the southwest. Here, let me draw this out. Let me see if I can draw it out. I got a pen here. Let's see if let's see what that looks like. Right. So what you're going to have is you have, you know, this milder air is trying to come in from the southeast in association with the ridge. But then you have colder air. I should have a blue arrow here, shouldn't I? But you, should, you have colder air trying to work its way down from the northwest. So along this baroclinic zone right in here, this is where you're going to get your main storm track. This is where you're going to get your heaviest precipitation. But look over here on the GFS model on the right, the um, baroclinic zone is way back here which means this area out ahead of it is gonna be nothing but warm southerly winds and very mild temperatures outside of the higher elevations here where you see that pink color, a mix. Um, the heaviest snow is way back here in the Midwest to the Northwest of the surface low. So the Bear Clinic Zone, let's go back. The 23rd event, let me see if we can find it here. The 23rd event has a Bear Clinic Zone basically like this, all right? Why the GFS on the 23rd event has a barricling zone way back here. So there's a major difference in the operational models on today's runs on how far southeast this cold air gets and how strong is this upper level ridge out here. Okay, and what's the position of this ridge? It's going to try to keep the milder air closer to the east coast, mid-Atlantic to the southeast coast, the colder air in this trough is doing its best to try to advance southeast, and you have a battle going on along that baroclinic zone. We have a major battle that's occurring in the atmosphere, and you know we could see a very active pattern across the mid-Atlantic. Potentially, you know, depends on the conditions to the north here, the pressure system set up, but you know it could get up the east coast a little bit down along you know Massachusetts southward maybe, um, some heavier precip events as well. So this is real interesting. There's gonna be a big difference between where that bear clinic zone sets up. Again, that bear clinic zone is this red line here, okay? That's your zone, that's your boundary of the greatest thermal contrast. Very cold continental air here for late January and very mild air associated with the Southeast Ridge over the Western Atlantic waters. The battle zone is where those storms develop. That's the zone in which those low pressure systems let me just draw you a red L. That's your low pressure system. That's your storm. It's going to follow the bear clinic zone. It's going to ride that zone. It's going to be tapping into all that energy the atmosphere is providing it in the form of great thermal or temperature differences across that zone. So here's my final thoughts on tonight's video. All right. First of all, we talked about it. La Nina continues to weaken across the equatorial eastern Pacific. I showed you the um, <clears throat> I showed you the diagram here. For the latest La Nina, that was one of the first slides. That was the first slide I really got to. Minus 0.7, so 7 tenths of a degree Celsius below normal in Nino 3.4 region now. Weak La Nina, according to the latest figures or numbers released by the NOAA Climate Prediction Center. Warming is occurring in this area right here. See that? Look at our La Nina. It's going, the probability of La Nina is decreasing. Okay. All are indicative, we're, we're losing our La Nina. Those waters are warming in the Nino 3.4 region. That's the first point. Second point, MJO is headed towards phases two and three. Based on what I showed you earlier, you know, the Jeff's V12 and the European. And additionally, there's other models out there that I didn't quite show you in tonight's video, but they're also indicating generally a rotation to phases two and three. Now that's gonna favor enhanced precipitation, enhanced rainfall and convection, rising vertical air motion in the Indian Ocean in the phases two and three. These phases right here, okay? I showed you kind of like what that meant for us. Generally cooler than normal conditions for a large swath of the United States with phases two and three. The magnitudes are important. Uh, they differ. Jeff's V12, um, Jeff was showing a stronger magnitude out of all the models. 
Um, European model showing the MJO rotating back to the null phase. Now that's big. That's big. A weakening La Nina, so we have a weakening La Nina, plus we have a potential of MGL rotating back into the null phase, so where there's really no phase favored, and that would limit the you know, impacts on the United States weather, the upper air pattern. The stratospheric polar vortex is expected to weaken. This is at a minimum, it's going to weaken. Yeah, you know, it had that period where it was very strong, um, but now it's weakening and it's becoming displaced off the pole. Some models of GFS are still more bullish with a significant sun stratospheric warming event, significantly warming temps in the stratosphere. The GFS is showing that in late January. Um, you know, the other models are showing significant warming, but not to the degree GFS is showing it. So this could play a huge role in the late season weather, late winter season weather. Additionally, the teleconnections are changing. I showed you those differences and really highlighted those tonight for my Friday night video. We're seeing a more strongly negative EPO now, okay? So we're getting a more strongly negative EPO than a few days ago. But at the same time, we have that strongly negative PNA, right? So a strongly negative PNA is going to generally favor that troughing over the western U.S. and ridging in the east, milder temps in the east. The strongly negative EPO is going to favor the development of a ridge across the northeastern Pacific. Depending on where that ridge axis sets up, that's going to really delineate where that downstream troughing occurs. Um, if the ridging, the ridge axis in the northeast Pacific is further west, then you're going to get troughing in line with a strongly negative PNA. You're going to get troughing in the west. But if that ridge axis is further east, closer to the west coast, of Canada and the Pacific Northwest, you're generally going to get more of a situation where you get the trough further east. Now the high latitude blocking is starting to show back up on the models, and it's becoming more apparent across both the North Atlantic and the Northeast Pacific sides. Um, with the Northeast Pacific Ridge, with that in place, it effect effectively shuts off that Pacific flow while encouraging more cross-polar flow. Um, and one other point I want to make is Siberia has been really, really frigid recently. Um, so we have very cold air situated in Siberia. And if you get cross-polar flow, um, basically what you're looking at there is um, a direction of that flow, that cold air from Siberia into North America. So let me go back here real quick. Okay. If I get this nice strong ridge right here, this nice big ridge, all right, what's it going to do is it's going to promote more of a cross polar flow like this into the United States. It's going to it's going to basically come from Siberia and work its way all the way down on the front side of this ridge right into the US. So that's where we're watching closely. Additionally, ensembles are indicating a change to the upper air pattern with lower heights gradually spreading eastward, generally in that 25 to 27 January time period. Big question. Where does that bear clinic zone set up? Where? I talked about that. Where is it going to set up? That's going to be your storm track. And to the right of that bear clinic zone, it's going to be all rain. And to the left of that bear clinic zone, in the colder air, it's going to be wintry precip. Uh, it's going to be active. We're seeing multiple storms showing up on all the models, Canadian, GFS, and European, over the next 7 to 10 days. And then the timing and track of the storm system is going to be critical. It's going to be critical to determine which areas receive liquid versus frozen precipitation along the eastern seaboard. Um, is it all rain along the eastern seaboard? Are we to the right of the Barrett Clinic zone? Are we to the right of the storm track in the warm sector? Very interesting stuff. And then this one here, the stratospheric polar vortex. This is, this is again, this is the wild card in the deck of cards, okay? because it's definitely forecast to weaken. We can see that pretty much in model consensus, okay? Um, but how much does that polar vortex weaken? Will we see a displacement? Will we see an elongation? Then a recovery, quick recovery after that elongation, late January, early February. Will we see a split into two daughter vortices or two lobes after the major sun's transfer warming in February? There's different weather outcomes based on what ultimately happens to the stratospheric polar vortex. There's different timelines. 
you know, a split versus an elongation. Elongation being more immediate effects and a split being a little bit more of a delayed effect. And then that duration, the duration and the strength of specific teleconnections is very, very important. Okay, take a look at it. what's the magnitude, what's the duration um, of these teleconnections? How do they work either with each other or against each other? Constructive or destructive interference, I talk about it a lot. All right, that wraps up the video tonight. I hope you certainly enjoyed it. Um, just a lot of interesting weather going on. Um, you know, we're in the climatological time of year where you're typically going to get, you know, generally um, you're favored for a greater frequency or probability of snow. Uh, generally, it's going to be in this area right here. Let me do this real quick. Generally, in this area right here, you know, especially the Mid-Atlantic in here, this is the time the Mid-Atlantic really, I'd say, between 20 January and 10 February is really the sweet spot, the sweet window for um, snowfall across the Mid-Atlantic, this red circle area here, okay? Okay. Um, after past 10 February, it gets a little more difficult down here um, at these latitudes because the sun is getting stronger, your amount of daylight is increasing. So you're starting to have some stronger solar radiation uh, after 10 February down in this location. Now further up in New England here, you know, you have a longer window. You know, you can get winter, winter storms, you know, later in the season as compared to the mid-Atlantic down here. All right. That wraps up the video. Lots to talk about. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we'll be watching all these factors. We'll see how they interact amongst each other. Um, you know, right here, the La Nina as it continues to weaken, the MJO, the, the polar vortex, uh, teleconnections, how they change over time, magnitude, strength. And again, that position of the Northeast Pacific Ridge axis. Where does it set up? Location of the Barrett Clinic Zone. Where does that set up? And the timing of the systems. All about time. All right, that wraps things up, everybody. Until next time, take care and God bless everyone.